Ladies and gentlemen, Victor Brooks from the Victor Brooks Live Quarantine Series. And you know what, it's Saturday. And uh, you know what time that is. Every one o'clock, every Saturday and Sunday at one o'clock, we are here bringing our, 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 our message of positivity to the world the best we can. Um, and also, sometimes you may see us at three o'clock or sometimes later. Just keep watching for the promos, you know. But for sure, every Saturday and Sunday at one o'clock Pacific Coast time, um, uh, you, you'll see us here to uh, welcome artists from around the world. Um, you know, I, I've learned, in my, I just had my birthday on the 14th of May. So in my 55 years, I've learned my lane, <laughs> you know? And my lane is to just bring the artists that I love and I respect. And we tell our story of positivity and our message of positivity uh, to the world the best we can. And you've heard some incredible stories, you all. And, and I just want to put this pin in, you know? Um, you know, that we, just be, our, our moniker, our, our message of positivity in no way is trying to ignore nor the seriousness of what the world is going through right now. All of us are experiencing some things that we never, I, and I know for myself, never would have thought um, in, a, in a million years that we'd be dealing with, um, through our families, through our, our, our friends, uh, even when we watch, you know, the media or what have you, we, we, we never thought that this was going to happen. But you know what? Through it all, as my, my big brother Andre Crouch wrote a song, Through It All, back in the day, he was right. You know, through it all, there's always something to be, that we can be positive about. We can find something to smile about. Whether it's during this time of quarantine, calling our family members that we haven't spoken to or, or been in contact with in a while, um, the friends that we can just call and check on, you know? Um, and, 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 and even out when we're out in those times where we take the time to go to the store and then hopefully come on back home, you know, it's still something about that distance. Six feet, you can still see a wave, you know? Six, 10 feet away, you can still see a thumbs up, spreading positivity the best way we can. And, um, you know, I always like to, to give acknowledgement and respect to our first responders, our doctors, um, our lawyers, uh, um, our, our nurses, um, our uh, ambulance drivers, our police officers, um, EMT workers, our sanitation workers, you know, our, 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 our merchandise truck drivers, that when we do go to the store, there's food there that they've provided for us through their, through their, uh, through their work and, and reaching out. Um, my, my, my heart goes out to the family members who have been affected directly from this uh, time, you know, either through, unfortunately, death or illness. Um, my prayers are with you. Um, I believe in praying for the world, you know, I really do. Um, from my own little way, you know, just giving it back as best we can. Uh, but I also want to give smiles and, and, and praise to the ones who, who have come back, who are, who are getting better, who are finding their health back in a lot of ways, you know? Like I say, we're all in this together, y'all, and we're going to be okay. I really believe in that. Um, and you know what? Today is uh, like, like, like we bring all of our guests in who take the time out of their schedule. And just because we're on quarantine, it doesn't mean that everybody's life is just stopping, you know? There are some people who are still doing things to, uh, to in their daily life, and, and it just humbles me. And I'm so thankful for the people who've given their time to come on the show and, uh, and talk to me so we can talk to you. Uh, and present our message of positivity. We talk about their journey. We talk about their life, you know, and, and, and hopefully we always bring it around to a positive message for you, for all of us. And today, ladies and gentlemen, you know, it's a special day for me again, again, because um, I'm going to use the word in honor. It's an honor. Um, not just because of this person's uh, artistic accomplishments in the world of music, uh, his groundbreaking, his, his, his gate knocking down, you know, through his hard work and his dedication as an artist, not just because of that, and you're going to hear that story, but I had the opportunity to first meet this gentleman through my brother from another mother, Zay Ricardo, here in LA. And you all know 
me and Zay's history from way back, since 1996. And uh, when I first met um, Brother Mugi, is what I like to call him, uh, Mugi Canazio. But when, and he'll be on the screen here soon. Uh, but when I first met Mugi, it, uh, it, was like a, it was like a family connection from the get go. You just know real people. You know, you know good souls when you connect. And from that hello, it was on, you know. And uh, just let me give you a little, little insight here, you know. When we talk about Mugi Canazio, you all, we're talking about a Grammy Award nominee and winner in both Latin Grammys and the U.S. Grammys. Um, we're talking about someone whose career has engulfed and encompassed some of the greatest Brazilian artists ever, okay? When we're talking about Antonio Carlos Jovin, we're talking about movie, movie relationship. When we're talking about Sergio Mendez, we're talking about Brother Mugi's relationship. When we're talking about Ivan Lins, we're all the way, you know, and, and I'm even going to bring in uh, the work with George Benson right now. Not just in Brazil, but Brother Mugi's artistry has reached the world. And uh, Sarah Vaughn, you dig? Ray Charles. This is the sound. This is the, 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 that ear that when you hear that final product that many of us love when we say we put it on in our system, that engineering ear, this is what we respect and love. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome to our show. Brother Mugi Canazio. Mugi, are you there, brother? <laughs> hey, hello, guys. I'm here. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, you so me? much. Can you hear me? Hello? I can hear hello? you, man. I can uh, okay. hear you, brother. And as y'all see, this is a fedora man as well. I love my, <laughs> love my top pieces, man. That's it. <laughs> so, so listen, man. Thank, first of all, thank you so much for you taking the time to do the show. It's just an incredible thing. Now, in, in times in which we need to you know, to recycle our inner knowledge about everything is so good to have a source when you can, reliable source like you, to come and to, to see your shows and to listen to your, to your kind words and, you know, a lot of it I don't deserve as much, but oh, thank man. you much for <laughs> inviting me to your, to your party here, man. I feel you privileged. You got it, brother. You got it, man. Thank you. It's an honor here, man. And I, I see the people are, we call our, our people who join us every weekend, the, my positivity posse, you know, and this is, these are the people Perfect. around the world, you know, that are trying, we're all keeping this thing together, you know, keep trying to keep the smiles going and moving forward. Mugi, you are now in Los Angeles, right? Yes. And how long have you been here, brother? Uh, I've been here, well, I got here in 1977, the first yeah. time, 1979, sorry. And then I left briefly for a few years, three or four years, five years. And then I came back in 1988, and I've been here since then. Okay, because you're, of course, uh, to, to update the others, I mentioned that you're originally from Rio de Janeiro. Yeah. Uh, one of my, how do we call it, Cidade Maravilosa. Cidade you know? Maravilhosa. Yeah. Really, really cool. <laughs> Marvelous city, you know? And I remember the first time, brother, that um, I, I landed in Rio. Moved. Myself and my, my brother, Clifton Davis, we came to Rio in 1995. Wow. And man, I, as soon as I got off the plane, uh, coming through the airport, and as soon as I went outside of the airport, brother moved. I swear, I felt like I was coming home. And that was the first time I'd ever been there. I don't know what it was. I don't know whether it's just my soul excitement, you know? Because in my house growing up, my parents, that's where I fell in love with the Brazilian culture, Brazilian artistry. Growing up, when we, 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 all, we, we had the sounds of, of Tom Jobim, we had the sounds of Elisa Gina, we grew up with that sound. And whenever Black Orpheus was on the, the Sunday night movie, <laughs> the family would sit down and watch wow, it. Wow, so cool. Yeah, so brother, why do you feel, or what is your interpretation of the power that the Brazilian sound has has done to the music world? Well, well I, 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 um, I don't know. Uh, for me, I, well, I grew up with that, so it's something that for me, I never actually had to do much effort to find the best Brazilian music because that was playing my backyard, you know. I was born, I was born and raised in Copacabana. 
And then in a certain point of my life, I started to be staying in Copacabana and the weekends, I would go to the suburbs, which where I think all my musical influence came from when I put my first band together. You know, the people from the samba, Noel Rosa, Villa Isabel was the suburb in which uh, uh, my grandmothers used to live. So I had both combinations. I had uh, the coolness of Bossa Nova because it was exclusively Copacabana. You know, Bossa Nova was the, the cool vibe of Copacabana. But I also had the real stuff I mean, real stuff is not adequate. I mean, I also had the other side of the Brazilian musical culture present over the, the suburbs, which was, you know, a extraordinary experience for me. And, well, I remember, for you to see how important that phase was for me, I remember getting a bus 5 a.m. in Copacabana to go to Vila Isabel on Saturday. And then I will get there around 7, 7.15. I will get up with my friends in Villa Isabel. And I'll get the bus to come back to the beach in front of my house, where I live in Copacabana. But just the whole experience, the right. music and playing music on the, on the bus. You know, that's where Brazilian music got to be without me knowing exactly <laughs> that I was being, you know, uh, uh, surrendered by. Wow, you use the word surrendered by so, it. That's heavy, man. That's heavy. What do you yeah. mean by that? Yeah. What do you mean? But that's what it was. And I never, in, you know, in the early stages, you know, when I started my music career, uh, my, my influence, and I think that just about for everyone in my age, was the British Invasion Beatles and Led Zeppelin. Well, I actually remember the, when a good friend of mine called me to go to his house, okay. and he played me a Led Zeppelin album. The wow. first Led Zeppelin album. <laughs> I think I was 13 years old or 14 yeah. years old. And I remember clearly, like if it was yesterday, Vic, when, when we finished, I talked to myself, I know what I'm going to do in my life. I want to be with music. That's it. That's now it. I have to find where. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. The, the next thing for me to start, you know, actually, I was active. In my home, music was always extremely present. My grandfather was Italian, and his repertoire was a little more ethnic. Okay. It was a little more of Pepino di Capi and opera and all that. But I got to tell you, that also was very helpful, helpful on my foundation. You know, for yeah. you, when you deal with music, you, you, have, mm -hmm. to, you have to find love in every piece of work that you're doing because if you listen to something you say man i i cannot relate to this yeah you cannot you you just cannot do anything about it you cannot contribute because exactly. you know your heart is not into it so there you go brother and you know what move that was what what you just said that relatability to music man is you know i mean that that it is that's what makes that connection like you just said from the musician to the to the music lover the musician to the world you know that there's a connection there that people feel um and that's why i'm wondering moog like i'm when i gave my uh journey of of the respect of growing up with the brazilian music in my life from my parents i wasn't the only one of course there were millions around the world that here in the us when that brazilian sound hit our airwaves and on our television. What do you feel? What is it that we were connecting with, brother? Well, and still to this day. Well, I, I, think, I think that is a, uh, uh, the, 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 the essence of Brazilian music is extremely rich in every yeah. aspect. Obviously, first of all, rhythmically speaking, you, you get, to, uh, you get by, to be moved by a rhythm that is that is very cool, very yeah. good. Uh, it has a little bit of everything. It has a giant influence of Africa, mm -hmm. which all the rhythms where the rhythms the rhythms came from, but also it has uh, a coolness that makes that attract you for the rhythm. The uh -huh. second aspect is the the harmony, you yeah. know the chords and the voices if you have good taste for music yes. you know 
you start <laughs> noticing that the foundation from which you listening to their music has elements that you have never experienced before, at least that intensely, you mm -hmm. know? And then you hear say, man, you know, a lot of people ask me, Mimugi, I listen to some, some writers and I, and I find out that there are chords that I didn't know existed. <laughs> because gotcha. it, is, it is what it is. Yeah. And the melody, so all the three elements, it's very common for you to find in certain uh, uh, predominant in certain, in certain musical cultures, mm -hmm. a, a very intense rhythm or a very intense melody or a very hip harmony. Uh, okay. In Brazilian music, you, you can get all three at the same time. Same without, time. Right. At the same right. time. And <laughs> the, w what is so cool about it is that you listen and it doesn't seem like you had a brain surgeon or a scientist writing the chords and creating the music. I mean, it feels right. like you're in the street. You know, yeah. you, I mean, yeah. I'm going to mention Ivan Lins now, but there's so yeah. many songwriters, you know. Yes. You listen to Ivan Lins and you see him playing composed. I had the privilege to produce three of his records. Right. And, and I, you know, seeing him, hey, man, Ivan, Ivan, I think we need something uh, slightly towards this direction. He says, well, what about this? And he will write that on the spot. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, well, brother. Zé Ricardo, Zé Ricardo, our friend, I usually actually mention his record. Yes. Uh, uh, because we had this wonderful, wonderful moment doing Zé Ricardo's record. And I remember that we didn't have the whole repertoire yet. And then he was staying with me here in my house. And I said, well, you go up the room. You only come down when you have this bridge ready. You don't <laughs> finish the and then he will go up in half an hour. He'll come back to say, well, what was we had for dinner? I said, for you, nothing, because you have to work. No, it's not. Check That's it right. out. Said, okay. There you go. That's right. <laughs> like, let me hear the phrase. <laughs> You know, I was like, you know, we, we what, what you just mentioned there, it summed it up so, and I, I'm sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen, we have our, our list and people are just lining up here with agreements and, and shout outs and love to you, my brother, for oh, love to everyone. what you were just saying, you know, and, uh, you know, because I want to go back to growing up in Rio. You started as a DJ, if I'm, if I'm remembering correct, and then yeah. drumming came into your life, your love of drumming. When you were talking about that no. No, it was the other way around. I uh, became a drummer. Okay, okay. And then, and then I had this band together. The only problem that my band sucked. It was horrible. It's okay. <laughs> my band was pretty bad. Okay. <laughs> but you knew and, you loved music. You knew music. Oh, no, no, yes. I, I will say I'm not going to give up, but I, this route here, we, I'm going to start to do that. So <laughs> let me find something else to do. So I was already tuned in sounds and stuff. So uh, I, I developed the project of the, the sound system for a club in, in Copacabana, the beach of Copacabana. Okay. And I became a DJ because uh -huh. uh, okay. I, I wanted the thing to, to sound awesome. Yeah. And back in the days, the DJs were not what we're talking about now. I mean, for instance, there was not even a mixer. I had a friend of mine that was uh, one of those, you know, mad scientists That's who good. built a remote, small, remote, small, small mixer so I can yeah. blend the music. Before you should be a switch, you'd be playing one record and then you flip a switch and you play the other one. Uh -huh. So disc jockeying wasn't existent. It doesn't exist because you, you, you have to put your ears next to the needle to okay. find okay. out. <laughs> approximately what the rhythm was gotcha. having a picture now and because i'm a drummer so i'm really well related to rhythm now i'm starting to pile up two songs one on top of each other and the crowd was going crazy you know gotcha. okay that they never heard before it, yeah impossible how come what is this coming from right. it was and then i said well I think I like this idea of putting my paws into the music a little bit more mm -hmm. and creating different elements. That's when I decided that I said, you know what? I want to go to the kitchen. I want to start developing music. I want to start go being working from scratch. Right. Because it was, I was being, I was having that re immediate reward, the reward mm -hmm. of the crowd, you know, mm -hmm. before, yes. 
playing playing the band and all, all the stuff all my career as a as a drummer in the band it was so useful too because when i'm producing a record now if we get to a certain point of the music that i don't feel that is not taking off to where it should be yeah. uh, it it brings me to the days that i was a band player band, playing okay. that yeah. as you see the floor going away right, right. i would say two bars and modulation <laughs> one two three then we'll do a key change there you go to there make the go. crowd that's come back that's to, right yes that's because right. if you play the crowd goes away you're fired you don't get the next game there you go brother i mean come on man you just summed that up so <laughs> so perfectly because that whole foundation that you just talked about you know it was finding that thing that that thing that you were like that's what i want and and, and 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 brother, the 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 truth of the matter is, yeah, the, the you you should be able, you should actually it's mandatory that you keep your sensors very well tuned, because every single day of life, you 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 gotta learn something. You you have to. It's on, it's all it's all Come on. Yes, yes. All the, every single moment of your life, you look around. And you can learn something new that you can apply either to your trade or to your relationship with someone. Come on, or how man. do you fix something? You know, the truth is, and I and I believe that everyone is equally capable yes. to do that. Yes, you you might not equally capable to hold a hammer and to hammer a nail like someone yeah. else, but yeah. your capability of absorbing what you can learn. We That's all right. you know, but it's Oh, right. man, Moogie, you just it's went deep better. with me right there, brother. You just went deep with me again because one of the, and a piece of advice that I take with me for the rest of my life, man, my grandfather <clears throat> died when he was literally 99 and a half years old, right? Wow. And, uh, I remember my brother and I, we put him in bed one night and, uh, and it was literally uh, maybe about three weeks before he actually passed on. And uh, when we tucked him in and we, he was all comfy, I remember he looked at both of us. He said, grandsons, he said, remember this for the rest of your life. He said, try to learn something new every single day. Yeah. He said, try to learn something new. And, every, and then he said, and stay away from the ones who think they already know it. <laughs> you know, he said, if they don't feel like they have anything else to learn, that's the ones to watch out for. So, I mean, man, that's a that's a that's a message that I, I take to the core. What you just said, man. Yeah. Then, then they, you, you know. You see, that is a phrase. That is a phrase that I always I tell my kids, and you know, by an um, author called Charles Bukowski, and, and he says the following: the problem of the world is that intelligent people are full of doubts, while the stupid ones ones are full of confidence come on brother no you got to do that to us again repeat please the problem of the world is that intelligent people are full of doubts why this while the stupid ones are full of confidence there you go there you so go the, the thing is you you gotta be with your, as i said with your sensors tuned so you can absorb what is just floating around you and That's music, right, and music uh, That's you know, it's 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 incredible when you sit down in front of Vinny Colaiuta and you bring him to play a, tr a tracking session. Oh man! But but it is also incredible when you get off on Thirty Fourth Street on the subway and Come on. Come and on. there is one kid with this right. little plastic bucket playing this unbelievable groove. There you go. That's Vinny right. Cannot play. That's right. If the kid sits in the kit, he cannot play what Vinny does. And he, if Vinny sits in the, in the little made believe yeah. bench with a plastic <laughs> bucket and the guy playing and flipping with his foot, then you look <laughs> and then you listen to that. Yeah. Wow. 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 Really? That's a, exactly, brother. That's right. It's all around us. It's all yeah. around us, man. You know? And you know what? And movie so. I want to go from when, so when you found your, your, your feel of what you wanted to present musically, right? This happened before you came, of course, to the U.S. This yeah. was your foundation at home. This is yeah. where your, 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 your blood pump of music mm -hmm. at home, you know? Yeah, exactly. So you brought, you brought your, 
your your foundational blood pump is what I'm gonna call it here yes. to the U.S. in um, and when you came here, brother, what was the first year you came to the U.S.? I came in, I, I landed in L.A. on August 17, 1979. It was the second birthday of my son, the day of the birthday. So I put the bags in the hotel, me and my wife and my two-year-old son, which is 44 now. And we went to, to the Safeway. Safeway still existed here. Yes. This is Vermont. <laughs> So we went to Safeway and I, we bought a cake and a couple of sodas and we celebrated his birthday. And then the journey started. When I got mm -hmm. here, it was uh, maybe the first and uh, the most difficult crisis in the music business because it was exactly when the disco music went down. Gotcha. So, and disco music was just about the most, uh, you know, uh, predominant so like I think in LA close to 300 studios closed just that month that I got wow, wow. so it was really uh, really uh, very difficult to get gotcha. any gigs or to gotcha. find a studio to work in the industry was right. depressed by that okay. but not not that that was not even enough to <laughs> to bring me you know my my willingness of gotcha. moving ahead. Now, you said, okay, well, this is one more obstacle. So there's, there's going to be more. So let's there get you go. to this. That's right. That's right. And then just, just, <laughs> just to see for you to see how much the, my first gig in LA, I was a a, a truck driver for a, a macrobiotic food supplier okay. All right. in Culver City. Okay, I was driving all around. Uh, town delivering, you know, sandwiches and all that. But keep this. First of all, for me, the glass is always half full, regardless. That's always a good thing. Come always. on, that's right. That's right. Always half there full. You go. There you go. So back in the days that we didn't have ways or GPS or anything, mm -hmm. we had the Thomas. Remember the Thomas, Thomas guy, the big thick book. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Be being a driver in LA helped me to learn the city, at least some of it. You know, mm -hmm. I used to do deliveries over in Gardena. Wow. You know, and we have to, be, and we had a window. We have to deliver in between two and three in the morning. So ah. we have to get there. And, and I would play nice with all the other truck drivers. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> and listen to their music because my thing was music. I was just trying to make my living, you know. That's right, brother. That's right. So when you're to, after uh, the now, I know that when you in your first trip to or your first time here in LA in the U.S. Now you started like some of the names that you started with, brother. Here, am I correct? Is like George Benson and Chicago yeah, well, and Real Speedwagon. What what were this well, independent or were you with the label? What what was that? No, no, no. Back in those days, there was no such a thing as independent engineers or anything like that. The only way that you could get to record an album or to be part or close to it was uh, through a recording studio. Okay. Independent didn't exist. I think right at, right before I left, one of the engineers that was working and uh, doing a lot of Rini and Angela. Yes. And That's Rufus right. and Chaka Khan. In the right, studio, right, right. Was, you know, uh, any more. Uh, he became, he decided to become independent right there. I mean, it was already, I was already leaving. So uh, I, after, you know, driving around and stuff, I managed to get a, a gopher position at Camden. Okay. Gopher is the worst gig you can possibly get in the studio, but I was really <laughs> happy. Man. I, I was a gopher myself, brother. I got you. <laughs> I still have my coffee yeah. burns, I think. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then... Uh, right after I was promoted to runner. And then after becoming a runner, I was promoted to assistant engineer. And then from assistant engineer became staff engineer, wow. which was, uh, which was, you know, a very prestige. Yes. Come uh, on now. How old were because, you then? Luke? How old were uh, you? I was 24. Right on, man. Right on. Yeah. yeah. But you know, uh, through this process at Kendon, Kendon was the top studio in the world, mm -hmm. basically. 
that was not a better student in the world. And I got to be involved to sessions, not necessarily engineering, but sometimes I'm assisting to the top game, you know, of yeah. music in LA. Mm -hmm. you know, George Benson, Mick Jagger, and Michael Jackson, uh, uh, Quincy all the time, Chris Bennett, Rufus, and Shaka Khan. Yeah. And the list goes on and on and on and on because the studio was really, there was, was a it. line of people trying to get time to yeah. work at Camden. A, literally a line of people, you know. If, yeah. if you had an opening at three in the morning, people come right. because yeah. the studio was such an incredible place. You know? Got you, brother. And yeah. then uh, it's a funny, a short, Please. funny story. Tell us in, yeah. <laughs> thing. I was, I was working in this as assistant uh, yeah. with this artist called Barry Maguire. Barry Maguire wrote "Evie of Destruction." Ah. Big, big name, big player, big amazing nice. artist, really nice guy. Yeah. And they were Christians. Okay. So the engineer, a guy named Ralph Osborne, great guy, amazing engineer, but he had a bad had a, a habit of cursing. Okay. So every, time he, <laughs> <laughs> every time he cursed, the producer had to stop the session. <laughs> And um, <laughs> great. So after th three or four days, yeah, he came to Ralph to say, "Man, uh, I'm sorry, but we're really behind schedule. You can't curse anymore. So right. because we we can't afford it, we have to finish their album. Every time you curse, we have to <laughs> pray and we have to stop the session. And then by the time you pick up again, you know that happened three, four times during the day." Right. And then, you know, it, it, got to, it got to the point that we have an agreement with the front desk. Every time okay. the crew will come in, he will go to the corner of the room and he'll be cursing out all the words. <laughs> but it, it just let it him didn't get help. it out, right? Just let him get it out. Yeah, but it didn't help. <laughs> so so the you first know what? time that, that day that he cursed, the producer stopped and said, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. We can we can afford to waste more time. So you need to you need to we need to find someone else. We love you, but we need to find someone else to finish the album because we just don't have the time. Yeah. And then he said, Well, Moogie, Moogie knows the record. He's a great engineer. He's right here. One and two. And I didn't curse. I, I told <laughs> him I didn't curse in the session because of that. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Uh, that saved the budget right there, you know. That no profanity saved the budget right there. No. I don't know if you can see the lineup, man, but these people are dying laughing on no, this. Okay. Right <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then move, you know. Okay, so you were here, man. This is an incredible journey, brother. Incredible journey, and then even you know. So now you, in some time around this, you made a decision to go back home, to back to Rio, right, or back to Brazil. Yeah. Okay. 19, 1981, towards the end of 1981, uh, my wife was pregnant of our second son. Okay. And she wanted to give birth to him in Brazil. And I felt that I had started to learn a bit enough mm -hmm. to bring it back home. And maybe I could be contribute a little bit more uh, to the music of my country that, you know, I never... Uh, neglected my mm -hmm. my you know my roots is very exactly. very I, I i always thought that that would be an asset for me exactly yes you know yes That's such right. incredible competition mm -hmm. you know just to be an extreme if i if i have to do a gospel record i'll have to come to so many of you guys to come in to i got you help me to move I around guess. because it's, it was not my my root my reality right. Right. whatever it is that i know is not yeah. enough compared to what you know hey, so that's you. another thing too, right now I but if it's in brazilian music you might have to come to me and say hey man can you give me a hand what exactly. is this doing? that's right <laughs> so I, I decided that i had to uh, go back to brazil and when i got there you know people found out that I was from Camden, then I had started my career here. 
So the Son Livre, which was the major studio and label in Brazil for many years, they, they came and they said, no, you're going to work for us. So go. they hired me in like one month. I became a director supervisor of the whole go complex. Go ahead. Go ahead, man. And, go. and then it, it, the, the, musically, the doors was just like, because then I got to work with Tom Jobim, man. Can you imagine? Good. Seeing in the room with Tom Jobim. Mm. And seeing Louisa, he, he came and he finished writing the song in front of me. And Tom Jobim did. Tom Jobim, João Gilberto, in 1985, ah. I did uh, Ivan Lins' album, you know, Sede dos Marujos, an incredible album. Yeah. At least Regina, last recording of the ones that I, that I did. Besides that, two more albums after she passed, because she was signed by Son Livre, and we recovered some tapes. And then the company and the state and her brother said, well, we want Mugi to finish up this thing. So, uh, well, the reason right. I'm saying is, yes, I, I was exposed. Uh, Son Livre was the top record company mm -hmm. associated with the global network. So yeah. well, we had a small cast, but, but every artist wanted to be part of Son Livre because having their music playing the soap operas. Gotcha. So okay. I, I got to work with the, all my idols. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. of them, including yeah. new ones that became my idols, you know, people that there I... You go, man. There you go, man. You know, like, I, I want to segue and ask you this, man, because one of my dreams in life was to, 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 to meet, uh, of course, Tom Jobim, John Gilberto, all of these people never had an opportunity. But through mm -hmm. their music, man, um, it's not just like, I want to say, not just myself, but for millions of other musicians, man, there was there was that foundation that we would put our, back in the day, our Vox headphones on and put our thick plug, plug into our, and turn our albums, you know, and just go away with what that feel and that vibe that what they were bringing to the world, man. Um, and what you just so eloquently started out describing, what that whole Brazilian sound and feel is the mixture. It's like, a, it's like a face water of sound. You've got yeah. your, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a thing, man. So much respect, my brother, much respect. And, 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 and for me, it, 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 trying to translate in terms of the Anglo musical culture, it was gotcha. just like if I was in one session with um, Nelson Riddle, yeah. Duke Ellington, Count yeah. Basie, at the same time, because right. that's exactly what happened then. You know, I did two albums. They were a soundtrack for a big play in Brazil. The, the, the music was written by Edu Lobo and the lyrics were written by Chico Buarque, which is Chico the, Buarque. Yes. It doesn't get better yeah. than a combination ah. than that. Well, hmm. Maria Bethania, that you know so well, I mean, throughout yes. my career, I, I produced 19 albums of her, 19. Which is what I, now? I were you be, involved with the tropical movement recordings as well? Yeah, well, the, no, my, my involvement with her was right after God, when the tropicalia movement got out, and then uh, in 1982, we did a, 19. Uh, a record of a TV show, a really cool musical. Mm -hmm. uh, and I miss the days in which they, they did you know five musicals a year to be broadcast on open cable TV. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. And one and one of the the my first encounter with Bethania as as the engineer slash producer yeah. was when she was invited to sing a song that was actually written by John Lucien. Remember John Lucien? Oh yes, John yeah. with the, the beautiful yeah. voice. And, yep. and Guilherme Arantes did the lyrics in Portuguese. And the title of the song is Brincar de Vivier, which uh, you know, playing, uh, playing life. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that I worked with her. And then 19 albums later, I was still working. Come on, man. 19 hours. And see, now that leads me into um, when you, well, when you left, so you made, and eventually you made a decision to come back to LA, right? Yes. I, I, I decided to come back in 1988. Okay. Because I was traveling too much to LA to work. It was too much traveling, and I said, 
well, and I also wanted to, there the, the was a, the point for me, I, I, I still consider myself a little bit of a scientist, mad scientist. That's right. You know? That's right. <laughs> I, I, my definition of scientist is someone that dedic, dedicate his life and his career without necessarily expecting any compensation. You just go because mm -hmm. you you got to dive into the thing. There you go. Right there. That's right. Go That's right. and dive and you want to learn and understand more. So in 1986, I've, I, had a, I did a trip to Japan. And there, uh, I, was one of, I was the fourth person to walk into a CD factory, CBS Sony. Okay. A few people in the world had ever. We were invited. Right. And I noticed there was uh, in Ginza, which is the main bubble of Tokyo, Japan, the, the top record store had a shelf with five CDs only, title, five titles. But I noticed then that that would be the next big step. That was it. So in 1988, I decided to come back to to LA because I needed to be on the top of the game of the transition of the digital universe. Gotcha. Gotcha. That was what actually, um, you know, made me, uh, you know, interrupt what I was doing. And then mm -hmm. I'm here. Mm -hmm. And then, like you say, the reputation was already established. The work had already been established. That, that signature Moogie sound. Yeah, and I, it was I, already established, I, I, and you brought yeah. that back with you. You brought it here. Yes, with you, you know. So at the, when you arrived back, Moog, was it? Did you notice a difference in the the industry, so to say, but between the time you had left and then come back, as far as the the type of recordings, the the direction of music itself, uh, was there a difference, or was it like just plugging right back in and saying let's let's go do the same thing? No, 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 no. The, well, the, first of all, there was a there was a real big difference, uh, musically speaking, technology, which a lot of times intoxicates a little bit. Technology uh -huh. was making possible for people to do work alone and then to merge the whole thing in, the, in, the, in one day. Yeah. Uh, studios, studios were not as, as mobile and inexpensive like they are nowadays because there was back still tape right. machines and all that. You mm -hmm. know, the digital, it took a couple, few more years before, uh, two more years for digital to actually be implemented in yes. workstation and all that. That's so it was, it was, uh, when I noticed also everyone going independent. So studios did not have any, just about, no studio had a staff engineer anymore. Okay. Everyone was independent. So gotcha. you had your own gigs and you hired a studio and you pay per hour and you come, the studio will provide you with, with an assistant engineer. If you wanted to have a studio engineer, you could use, but it was never, uh, you could not get a personality engineer being attached to uh, the booking of the studio. Mm -hmm. So it was reversed. Now, if you want to do a record with me, I will tell you which studios I want to go with me, with George Massenberg, Alberto, whoever. I'll say, mm -hmm. cool, let's book Ocean Way or let's book East yeah. West or Village mm -hmm. or whatever. Here we go. So that was the main difference. Uh, I got you. Know? you. I got you. And mm -hmm. yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, now engineering became a, a, a independent scenario in LA, and uh, right before that, producing too, because I met Jack Dorothy. Jack Dorothy mm -hmm. was a staff producer and produced Carpenters. Right. That's and right. So he did all that amazing work, and he was a salary. Legend. Yeah. yeah. I got and he, and he, he was a salary, and I remember. Yeah. Uh, when I met him, he wasn't mm. too happy because he was trying to recover some compensation for the royalties of the records that he did. And I don't even know the outcome of that. Mm. But it was exactly when things started to become independent. Gotcha, brother. And you know what? Because I have, we have so many musicians, of course, who are on this lineup. And mm -hmm. some just it were like, you know, crea uh, salary for creative, you know? And that, that like, that's a... You know, the education that we're getting here through you, Mook, it, there's, a, there's a term 
that we use, of course, I know you know it's called OG. That means original, right? Mm -hmm. You are definitely, you know an OG when you, when you somebody that's been in a certain arena that as okay. from the beginning, they've seen it change and then they see what's happening now. You know, so what you. you're giving us is your story, but you're also giving us that OG education on the journey of the music industry the, uh, above Brazil and the United States, mm -hmm. which really means I would think globally that as far yeah. as the music industry, the industry, the recording itself, because you brought up a term, you mentioned independent back in the, the day there, that now independent and the recording of independent as an artist, as a producer, as a writer, so many people have in their, in their homes, you know, in the garages, in their places that they're developing their music. Um, in my opinion, I believe that there's a place, a huge place for the voice of the independent artist, the voice of the independent writer. But I also solely believe that, like I mentioned before, that I know my lane at 55 years old, that there's still a lane that seasoned professionals, such as yourself, such as my big brother I call Wayne Vaughn, who, you know, Maurice White before he passed, you know, these are people who, who I'm glad educated me on that, that ingredient of being open and respectful to the idea that the ears that establish the sound, I, you, follow, you see what I'm saying? That oh, it's, it's still viable. Well, Ben, check this out. Uh, it's a team effort. Yes, right? exactly. exactly. It's a team effort. You know, you just, uh, let's just, just to illustrate a little bit, let's step aside of the music business. Let's talk about cooking. Okay. Right? You can have the best piece of meat and the most incredible uh, you know, vegetables and all that. Yeah. If you if you don't know how to cook it well, it's not going to be as good as if you bring someone that knows how to cook well. That's what he does. I got and you. Then you mm -hmm. give that the amazing piece of meat and the vegetables and all that. It's going to make this amazing meal for you to eat. I think in in the in record making, it's just about the same thing. Yeah. Obviously, I don't I don't promote people not pronouncing their artistry because mm -hmm. they don't have the resources, you know, yeah. one guitar it. and a vocal and you play and the music is out that's there. That's true. You, you have to, that's but true. if you intend to transport that into, uh, 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 to bring the attention to the mm -hmm. whole universe, I got you. you have to surround yourself to people that know how to move parts to get to there. Right. Because, yeah. If your music is really beautiful, but your guitar is not in tune properly, or mm -hmm. when you sing, you didn't land the proper notes, and you don't yeah. have someone yeah. that can tell, hey, you know, it's, it, it's, it's like you're not giving the best uh, usage of your talent. Exactly. So I got the, you. The problem with, the, with, with being so extremely independent, that's, that also became... Oh, okay, I do everything on my own, and that will be just fine. And there's so many records that people send me to mix, and I listen and I say, sorry, I can't do it because it's really gotcha. not gotcha. done right. You know, you have to go back and recut the vocals. and be, mm -hmm. Because, it, oh, but, now, but I, I, well, I didn't have enough resources to do in the proper system. Yeah, I understand that. I, I understand, but, well, mm -hmm. maybe it would be better for you to stop and assess your losses right now so you can then bring it to the point where it will be useful. Because right now, if you do it, it might, it might not take you anywhere. So gotcha. you're going to waste a lot more of your time and your, you know, your assets to do it. So. Right. And you know what, Mood? You just put that in, the, in the, that, that perspective right there, brother, and that, uh, that advice of wisdom that you gave. And just to reiterate to the musicians, and I know we have – so many independent artists that are watching right now, just to reiterate what, what, what I'm saying for sure, and I think that the, the conversation is flowing, continue your artistry, continue writing, continue, as we say, banging it out on your own, you know, and, and, and doing your independent creativity, you know, stay in the room that you're in, whether it's your house, whether it's your garage, whether it's someone else, and your private independent creative area. Keep Absolutely. doing 
y'all. Keep writing that music. And, but on top of it all, be open to the idea. I remember, and I'm going to go back to, to, to Wayne and Maurice White again. They helped to educate young Victor in the understanding of being open to the idea of walk, stepping away from your creative baby because it's easy to be tied into it to feel that there's nothing else that, that needs to be done. So yeah. as an artist, what, you know, artist to artist, man, just getting wisdom like this, the positivity that's there, it's not over, y'all. Even the independent artist, it's not no, over. No, just no. because the industry's changed, it's not over. Keep doing your Absolutely thing. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, you, you, just have to, you just have to use common sense and be able to assess whatever it is that you establish as a priority. You know, you, you, you might not need to have a whole closet full of expensive clothing, right? Wardrobe. That's right. But I'm pretty sure you have one shirt and one set of pants and one shoe. Oh, they look good. Right. So you, right. you spend most of the days in your life in those really old pajamas and the really shorts and the beaten up socks. But then one moment you change and you go out and you put yourself I mean, adequately. That's there what you I mean. go, brother. You know what? And you know what, Moog? I want to say because, brother, your journey uh, that you've so gracefully told us and in detail about today, man, um, am I correct to say that around 92, 93, Moogie Canazio was the first Brazilian engineer to be nominated in the best engineer non-classical album category? Yeah, 1992, what was, Brasileiro. What was, what was that feeling like, brother? That, that was in Sergio Mendez's album, right, Brasileiro? Yeah, Brasileiro. Well, the feeling is like, well, every time you're nominated, is the, the same, right? I, I yeah. still have goosebumps and butterflies when the <laughs> nomination comes you never, you never get enough, you know, That's David true. Foster says that. You never yeah. get enough Grammy <laughs> denominations. But that one specifically for me, he represented uh, uh, that I, I, I see, well, I think, I think now I, I accomplished uh, the, the starting point of my career. There you go, brother. That was the starting point of my career. Yes, now, yes. I, I did the, uh, this record that were, that were based on my concept and my ideas and, uh, and my fingers getting through it as an engineer and Sergio is a extraordinary producer. This guy oh, here is that. Come on, right? man, just multi-talent, yeah. Wow. That's right, that's right. So the, that was so important because that kind of, you know, presented to me uh, uh, being part of a very select group of professionals that they were all my idols, you know. Yeah. I was in the same category as Bruce Redeem. Bruce Redeem was dangerous. Michael Jackson Ooh. and me. Yes. And he is my biggest idol of all time. And we have worked together on Surgeon's album. And he also hired me to work in a couple of sessions for Michael in Dangerous. Right on. Man. And right. when the nominations came out, he was the first phone call I got. Mm -hmm. The very first phone call. Hey, Mookster. There you go. Hey. Hey, man. <laughs> and that was his line. So I'm calling you if I was a real man, I'll vote for you. But I'm not. I'm going to vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, hey, hey, Bruce, it's all good, man. But if I was a real man, I'll vote for you. But I'm not. So I'm going to vote for me. So we <laughs> even, we even. So, I got you, man. <laughs> so now imagine what it represents. Because... I, I got to add this really quick. Please, People please. know Bruce Redeen yes. because of, of Thriller. Yeah. When, when Bruce Redeen did Thriller, people pay attention to Off the Wall because he was the engineer for the album before. Mm -hmm. But Thriller was the album that kind of worldwide made Bruce so famous. Now, remember the days that I was a DJ that I was telling you? I wrote a letter to a company in New York called Brunswick Records. Okay. Because there was a certain record that I played in the club and it sounded so much better than all the other ones. Wow. And I needed to know why. Because I wanted to make sure that I could make my club sound everything as good as. Gotcha. On the record, it was a 45. 
it had the name of the producer and the arranger only. Wow. So I wrote a letter, a piece of paper, and I wrote, Dear Sir and Ma'am, can you please tell <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. right. me And that most likely took a month to get to, re to New York, and right. then another month to come back. Yeah. And the reply was, among things, I said, well, the, this record, the engineer for this record is a man named Bruce Sweden. Yeah. The record was Ogre Girl, Shy Lights. Come on now. Remember? Yeah. Classic. Yeah. Classic. So I, I am connected with Bruce Sweden, my idol, since 1972, even before I decided to do what I do. Mm. Now, imagine what it was for me when my phone rang and it was Bruce to say, oh. hey, man, congratulations, your nomination, you, you know, you did an amazing job. So, <laughs> honestly, I couldn't care less for the results because I there usually you say, you, you stay nominated for 45 days and you were winner of a Grammy for one minute because the next minute you're already in the next Grammy. So, so oh, oh, just the privilege of having your biggest idol, mm. big, top idol for 20 years. <laughs> and congratulate me that alone was a oh brother that is a fantastic story man the people and when you watch back you'll see people are just giving hands up and thumbs you know that's a great, that story is inspiring man you know and that's what this whole thing is about brother it's about hearing the journeys and then hearing the ups and the downs but then realizing that hey it's gonna be it's gonna be all right. There's a positive string here, you know? Yeah. And that's what that's what this old goofy smile that I keep giving <laughs> for this whole thing here, you know? Because over your over your career, and it's, it, we're gonna we're gonna include Latin Grammy and US Grammys. There's a total of 39 nominations yeah. of you, correct? Yeah. 39, my brother moved. Yep. Yeah. Right on, man. I won nine. You won nine. See there? What, and and with, with when you look back on that mood, brother, you told your story of how you felt when your when your idol hit you. But when you look, and we can, we can't forget about the Emmy either. The Emmy that I see behind you is there. Two Emmys behind you. So when we hear your journey that you just shared with us, brother, from the the, the beginnings in Rio and and going as a drummer first, and then your whole story that you just gave to us and then brought us into now where we're looking at Emmys over your shoulder, brother. What is that, where are you at with that move? What, what do you feel, man, with that right now? And then, you know, what can you give that other engineer that's coming up, brother? Well, I have to, to answer you, I have to quote this one amazing cellist. Uh, I think he is originally from Ecuador, Paulo, Paul Cal, Paulo Calais. 94 years old, extraordinary musician. So he was giving an interview and the, the, the person asked him, uh, you, you may be one of the top musicians in the world right now and you're 96 years old. And I heard that you still practice, rehearse every day, five hours. And she asked him, but why? And he said, well, I think I'm improving. <laughs> there you so, have it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. You know, in our in our business, that you don't you would never reach your your yeah. top. Yeah. You're just yeah. floating yeah. around yeah. this mysterious point. And yeah. when when I look back, I I, mean, I have this uh, I'm obsessively grateful for yes. all the blessings that I got, you know. Brother, right on. They start, they start with, uh, I usually say, my, my mistakes help me a lot. Come on now. That's right, Moo. That's right. The people that didn't believe in me helped me a lot too. Come on. Because man. I wanted to prove that. That's so, right. you see, if, you, if you're in the right set of mind, it doesn't matter what the source or the content, it is useful. Yes. Because, yeah, man, you know, this guy from Brazil, engineer from Brazil, is not going to say, well. 
<laughs> exactly. I, I never, I never let that stop me. In mm -hmm. fact, that was uh, only a big encouragement. So when I look back to all every all the blessing that I had, yeah. um, well, I feel extremely grateful for all the opportunities that I was given because. If I, if I was not given the opportunity to do the record with Sergio, I would not be nominated. I Come would not on. be the first Brazilian to be nominated. So I was Come given on. the opportunity. He, right. he was the one that saw uh, that I had what it required for, for him to express his music. He's established. He's a, a big artist. And he's heard and saw in, in my work something that he aggregated to his. And, mm -hmm. and I grabbed the opportunity like I do every record. Yeah. It's the most important thing for me at that moment because my dedication is, is it, I'm fully dedicated to, to the projects that I'm working sure. because I wanted to please myself most than anyone else. I don't mix for anyone else. I mix for me. When I'm mixing and I hear that little bell, and I think, wow, man, this is where I wanted to stay. Fine, good. Yeah. And I'm passionate. If you come and start asking me stuff that I don't think it, it, it's adequate as taking out of the music, I will pro try to prove my point that we are in the right place. And, that, and that, that applies for just about everything. When I'm recently, the last 15 records that I produced, I did <laughs> all, all, all the records that I did live with yeah. guitar out band and vocal. Everybody's singing and playing live at the same time. Right. Because oh, that I is love a, that. On that, that is very pleasing to me. Powerful, man. I really don't, I, it doesn't, it's not rewarding for me when you spend two and a half days on the kick drum and then two days on the snare. So listen, man, Come on, man, crazy. preach. Come on, man. I'm 100% with that, brother. I was right? the other day, so funny. I was the other day, uh, uh, yeah. Brenda Russell, a dear friend, and I'm know, I'm sure you know. Oh, I yes. did an album with her, and she she used one of the tracks of the album that we did called the track is uh, "Walking in New York," mm -hmm. uh, because she wanted to honor all the you know nurses and doctors and front mm -hmm. first responders in New York, mm -hmm. and that I'm going to dedicate this music. She posted. Yeah. Yeah. And I heard the music and immediately came to my head um, when we were tracking. We were tracking the NRG. And then we did two or three songs. Vinny, Vinny was the drummer. Vinny Colaiuta was the drummer. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then <laughs> Vinny did his, his three songs. And then the next song was a different drummer. And the drummer was Sheila. Sheila East. Sheila yeah. East came yeah. to yeah. play the record on that oh, one song, goodness. Walking in New York. So oh, what I... I did this. I went to the studio and I moved the mics so they could yeah. take Vinny Colayuda kit and put her. And I just moved the mics back again. Yeah. And she sat down right. just to get a groove going. When yeah. I walked in the control room and I said, Brenda, I'm going to record. Boom! And record it. That was there it. That go. was the song. There you go. See Nobody that? even noticed that we were taking because the vibe was so. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Come on, man. Come on. When it's right, it's right. When, yeah. the, when the feel is there, it's there. You know, um, Wanda Vaughn of the Emotion, she was uh, Wanda, and actually, that's Wendy, who's you met, that's her mom. And uh, she told the story of how when the Emotions recorded Stax Records back in the early 70s, what you just described is what she said was there had to do. They yeah. had, they, there's something about being all in there together, you know, and that feeling of, 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 of that, that, that vibe that comes out, brother. It, that's, what's la that's what has lasted to this day, you know, when it's there, it's there, brother. Oh, man, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want this to stop. <laughs> I don't want this to be over. And I know from, from what I'm getting on this list, you don't either. You know, like, like Moogie and I were just saying, when it's good, it's good. When that feeling is there, it's there, you know, you push that record button to let it keep going. It's undeniable. And uh, once again, Moogie, I just want to thank you for taking your time today. Thank you for having me here, man. Go yes, <laughs> And telling us your journey, your story, you've inspired. You, uh, your, your humbleness is, um, 
is so real and incredible that I can feel that what I'm about to say, I'm just going to give it up. I got to give it up. But I know that, you know, it's a thing where, uh, you know, you, you preach to us, you, you gave us wisdom today, you gave support today, you gave positivity of your journey today, my brother, you told us your story. And I know from when you look back, so many people that have lined up to watch, it's helped so many. Thank you again. And, and you know what, let my positivity posse, I'm going to speak to you. Thank you all for taking your time every single Saturday and Sunday to come and, and like I always say, come and get some of this positivity on you every weekend. You know, go swimming in the positivity, scuba dive in it, take a shower in it. And when you come up out your positivity pool and that little water's on there, flick it off on somebody else, y'all. Because that's how we share it. That's what we're supposed to do. We give it back and we try to do what we can do. And this is just our way. Myself, um, my co-producers, my brother Christopher Brooks, my sister Julie McKnight, and Wendy Vaughn. That's, that's our purpose of doing this, you know? I know we're not a big format. I know, you know, we don't have millions of followers and viewers, but hey man, I'm, I'm just gonna say it without getting too emotional. If there's just a few people that can walk away from these interviews with that feeling of, hey, I can go on, you know? I can, I can smile with this. Then, hey, mission accomplished for us, you dig? That's all we're trying to do. I love you, Positivity Posse. Thank you so much for all that you're doing on your own of, um, of keeping yourself as positive as you can. And come on back with us today at seven o'clock p.m. Uh, or to this evening at seven o'clock p.m. Pacific time. I have my brother from another mother, Zehi Cotto. I'm staying in Brazil today, y'all, staying right here, my second home. Um, uh, and I, he's going to join us today to tell his story, his journey. And we'll talk about uh, what, you know, we've done together and, 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 and just have a good time of positivity as well. Tomorrow, we have Carolyn Griffey, my sister from another mister from Shalomar. Uh, being the daughter of Dick Griffey of Solar Records and keeping that story and legacy alive. She'll be here telling that journey and that story. Thank you so much again. I love you. And we'll see you next time on the Victor Brooks Show. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thank you, Vic. It's so good to see you, man. You got it, brother. Love you, Moo. Peace. Love you too, man. <laughs>